These went from around 120 US dollars to overnight selling on eBay for several thousand dollars. My friends and family don't actually know about this room. I think they'd probably be quite shocked if I ever opened the door and they saw the Lego that was in here. This thief is stealing $1,500 worth of Lego, according to the store's owner. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Over the past decade, there have been a slew of Lego thefts, including one totaling about $300,000. But why are thieves around the world targeting a toy? Well, one reason might be that the most expensive Lego sets cost more than an iPhone 15. That's why this guy was trying really hard to reach the top shelf. These went from around $120 to overnight selling on eBay for several thousand dollars. My friends and family don't actually know about this room. I think they'd probably be quite shocked if I ever opened the door and they saw the Lego that was in here. But it wasn't always like this. In 2006, Lego's most expensive set was $270. So how did we get here? How did Lego go from a children's toy to a collector's item? And why is it so expensive today? Lego is the world's largest toy company, but its story didn't start with plastic bricks, it started with wood. While Lego found success with wooden toys, the company's first major turning point came in 1949 when its founder took a gamble and started manufacturing plastic bricks. Plastic toys were cutting edge technology at the time, but Lego wasn't the first to pursue this idea. Here are two patents by a company called Kitty Craft from 1939 and 1945. And well, you can decide how much inspiration Lego took. Plastic bricks didn't click right away. Lego had to stick with the product and innovate to pull kids away from wooden and metal toys. And to understand the price of Lego today, we have to rewind to its very first set. It was just a box of bricks without instructions. Some of the earliest gift sets cost 25 Danish krona, about $60 today. But in 1955, Lego released the town plan a simple version of the sets we have today. Kids built buildings and combined them to create little Lego cities. With this release, Lego solidified what it called the system in play. Its guiding philosophy would be that every brick should fit together and stand the test of time, allowing kids of all ages to build in unlimited ways. And we can't not mention the reasonably priced line. Then, in 1958, Lego perfected its bricks with the stud and tube method, an interlocking design that enabled large yet stable builds. Lego uses that design for its bricks to this day. Lego is brilliant pieces that were built from the beginning of Lego Interact with pieces that were built today with just a few exceptions. Do you know about brown? There were some brown bricks that were made during a certain period of Lego that were more delicate than others, and if you try to build with some of those bricks today, they're a little brittle. But 99.9% .9 of all Lego that has ever been made is designed to stand the test of time and is awesome. By the 1960s, plastic bricks were a hit, and Lego made them its full focus. But at the time, Lego's products were still pretty simple. Aside from reinventing the wheel in 1962, its builds were blocky and predominantly used the classic rectangular brick. Lego's second major turning point came in the 1970s when it started to release more creative sets like the 1978 Space Cruiser. It had 170 pieces and cost $10 or about $48 today. Lego referred to these themed sets as the system within the system. They added new pieces that expanded the Lego palette like colored transparent parts and thrusters. For builders like Dave, these pieces expanded the possibilities of Lego. Throughout the 70s, Lego transformed from a toy into a creative medium, releasing dozens of new parts, sets, and even debuting the iconic minifigure. The company experienced huge success and worldwide growth in the 1980s. But much like those brown bricks, cracks were starting to show. By the late 1990s, sales slumped and the company was losing money for the first time ever. Lego had grown rapidly and spread itself too thin, investing heavily in theme parks, media properties, and merchandise. 
Meanwhile, sales for its original focus, the brick, were slipping. LEGO released sets that required less building, ignoring what fans loved about the toy. Take the Galador theme, which barely resembles a LEGO product. Glitching was not going to save LEGO. Sets like those had one-off pieces that didn't fit into the LEGO system. They cost more to manufacture and were less profitable. An executive would later say, we had actually seen a decline in profitability, yet we continued to invest as if the company were growing very strongly. We failed to realize that we were on a slippery path. The company's annual report described 2003 as a very disappointing year for LEGO. Company executives were also concerned that physical toys might not keep up with the exploding video game industry. One of the few things that kept LEGO afloat was Bionicle, the company's bestseller for four years straight. Another bright spot was its licensed Star Wars sets, first released in 1999. These ranged in price from $6 to $90, and they flew off the shelves. Licensed sets would become hugely important for LEGO, but more on that later. Outside the company, something unexpected was growing all on its own. It turned out that kids weren't the only ones who thought LEGO was fun. Dave is what some people refer to as an adult fan of LEGO, which, I don't know I mean, it's a term that we use somewhat endearingly, but it's also a little cheeky. His skill and passion for LEGO earned him a spot on the TV series LEGO Masters, which millions of viewers watch weekly for its competitions between adults. But the hobby looked a lot different when Dave first started building. Before the 2000s, even LEGO's most complex sets had young age recommendations, like 9 and up, or 11 to 16. But that didn't deter creative people like Dave from getting into the hobby. By the 1990s, there was a growing group of passionate fans like Dave who had either played with LEGO as a kid or discovered it in adulthood as a creative outlet, and they were spending a lot on LEGO. For enthusiasts, having a room or an entire basement dedicated to LEGO is a common practice. In the 1990s, the passion of builders like Dave was quietly growing, waiting for a spark that would forever change the hobby. When the internet started to catch on, people like me who had been building discovered that there were other people like me, and it was great to be able to connect to see that other people were building. It wasn't just like building in solitude. And that's really, I think, when LEGO started to become something else, and not just a kid's toy. But LEGO didn't always accept or understand its adult fans. One former executive said that decades ago, LEGO saw fans like Dave as a source of irritation. Another said LEGO didn't think their adult fans had value. But adult fans found ways to connect and grow their community anyway. The first LEGO fan convention was held in 2000, and more followed. At conventions, builders showcased their creative displays of LEGO in all sorts of fun and unexpected ways. And it's crazy what people come up with. When LEGO noticed how fans used its products in ways that it never anticipated, the company started paying attention. It would ultimately change how LEGO made its products and even set the company on the path to its third major turning point. Today, LEGO isn't just a toy, it's a community, an art form, and for some, a way of life. Whether you're a kid playing on the rug or an adult designing a masterpiece, LEGO has the power to inspire creativity, connection, and even a bit of nostalgia. And as the community grows, so too does the potential for what these tiny bricks can build.